Hey YouTube, I'm Cyber Aquarius, and welcome to the first video of Reefing Fundamentals. As we go throughout Reefing Fundamentals, we're going to explore some popular topics related to reefing, and we're going to break them down to their fundamental core. Now the first thing I want to say is that there are many paths to success in this hobby, and there are many more paths to failure. No matter which path you choose, the fundamental principles that we're going to look at are going to apply to you. They exist in nature, and they exist within our aquariums. Now today we live in a day and age where if we want to know some information about a topic we can just go on a search engine, type it in, and as all of you know within this hobby nine times out of ten it's going to take you to a forum. And on forums it seems like everybody's an expert. Well there's some good information on forums, I'm not putting them down, but we don't know where the commoner is getting their information from. So what we're going to do throughout Reefing Fundamentals is we're going to look at articles that are backed up with scientific data, scientific research, and I'm going to post a link to an article below that you can click on to get more information relating to the topic within each video. Click on the link below and that, bit, that article is going to take you to links to other articles with similar information. Now, it seems like the question I get asked most often lately is how do I dose my aquarium? or how do I maintain the essential elements of calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium? Well, no two aquariums are the same. You can take two identical aquariums, buy the exact same equipment, the same amount of live rock and corals, and you could mimic my dosing regimen and not experience the same results as I have. So rather than me showing you what I do, we're gonna look at the essential elements, the fundamental principles, and see how they react with one another in the aquarium and in nature and we're going to take that information and apply it to setting up a dosing regimen or maintaining the essential elements with other means, uh, caulkwasser, three-part dosing, the balling method, um, or two-part dosing. But the first thing we need to understand is that natural seawater is super saturated. So I've set up a pretty cool little illustration to help you guys understand what I'm talking about. So let's go over here and and take a look. All right guys, so the first fundamental principle that we need to understand is that natural seawater is super saturated. It has a solubility point. You can't just keep dissolving elements into seawater and expect it to continue dissolving. Eventually you're going to get precipitation. So this first little demonstration I'm going to show you here, I can't take credit for it. I read about it somewhere before. I can't remember where. But I thought this was the perfect illustration to use to help you guys understand what happens with calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium being dissolved in seawater or synthetic seawater. Imagine that this empty bowl here is a given amount of synthetic seawater. And our blue marbles are going to represent calcium. The green marbles, that will represent uh, carbonates and bicarbonates, uh, alkalinity, and then these white or silver colored marbles are going to represent magnesium. Now what we can do is we can add some calcium. Now we can add some alkalinity. And we can add some magnesium. Almost getting to the solubility point. All right, some more alkalinity. Now let's try to force in some more calcium. All right. They, they're starting to spill out because it won't hold anymore. Well, the same concept applies to seawater. You can only put in so much calcium, alkalinity, magnesium, borate, uh, the different elements before they start precipitating out of solution. Through that demonstration, I hope that everybody can see that water has a saturation point. And more specifically, that salt water, whenever the essential elements are balanced out in their natural state, that salt water is super saturated. So we're going to have to determine what do these levels need to be in order to avoid active precipitation. What is active precipitation? Well, it can occur in one of two ways. The first is whenever water has reached its saturation point and it cannot hold any more of the elements. These elements are forced out of the water column 
in the form of solids, and two, it can occur whenever magnesium levels are kept too low. This allows calcium and bicarbonates to bind together in the water column, and they're forced out of solution in the form of a white chalky residue. This residue will get all over things in the aquarium from heaters, your glass, pumps. It can even clog pump impellers to the point where return pumps and wave makers can be rendered inoperable. So we want to be sure that whenever we set our essential elements that we're safe in, in avoiding active precipitation. Before we go any further, you may be new to the reefing hobby or you may just be simply doing your research, trying to learn all that you can before you set up a reef aquarium. And you're asking yourself, why are we concerned with calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium in the reef aquarium? Well, stony corals, LPS corals, large polyp stonies, and SPS corals, small polyp stonies, they pull calcium and bicarbonate at a ratio of one to one from the water column. They combine the two to form their skeletal structure of calcium carbonate. Whenever this occurs, the coral must pump that hydrogen ion that was attached to the bicarbonate compound into the surrounding water column. Now this is important to understand. As pH drops, we know that there are more and more hydrogen ions present in the water. It becomes more and more difficult for a coral to calcify as the pH drops. Imagine blowing up a balloon. It's pretty easy to blow air into the balloon whenever there's not a lot of air in it. But as the balloon becomes fuller and fuller, it's more increasingly difficult to blow in more air. Well, the same concept applies whenever corals calcify. All right, so what do our essential element levels need to be in the reef aquarium? First, we're gonna talk about alkalinity. Alkalinity is the only of the three essential elements that we're gonna elevate above natural seawater levels. And that is because we're dealing with an enclosed system. In an enclosed system, we have excess nitrogen compounds and the excess bicarbonates will help offset the negative effects, reducing the downward shift of pH. Also, we wanna make sure that we have elevated bicarbonates to provide for accelerated coral growth. Now, elevating alkalinity above natural seawater will increase coral calcification. It's the only of the three parameters that will do that. Uh, typically, we're gonna maintain alkalinity within a range of eight to 12 degrees carbonate hardness. Typically, alkalinity ranges from 5.9 to 7.0 degrees carbonate hardness in natural seawater. Now, the next essential element, calcium, is the one that I hear the most conflicting advice on. I hear some people suggesting maintaining it as high as 500 milligrams per liter because of positive ionic pressure on the cell of the coral will increase calcification. Well, that's not true. Again, click on the link below and read the scientific information for yourself. It's been proven that corals do not calcify any faster once calcium goes above 360 milligrams per liter. It's either all or nothing when calcium is concerned. Calcification begins at 360 milligrams per liter. I'm not suggesting that we maintain 360 milligrams per liter because of inaccuracies in tests, and it can go below 360 in a heartbeat. So our target range is gonna be 420 milligrams per liter. This is gonna allow uh, up to 40, uh, 40 milligrams per liter of testing inaccuracy. It's gonna allow for calcification and not risk a chance of any precipitation. Now the last essential element, magnesium, can be a quite complicated topic, but we're gonna just keep it in its simplest form. Basically, magnesium is a referee between calcium and bicarbonates. It prevents the tube from binding together in the water column, uh, causing active precipitation. Also, corals do uptake magnesium to a lesser extent than they do calcium and bicarbonates. Magnesium can range anywhere between 1,220 to 1,380 milligrams per liter in natural seawater. In the reef aquarium, we're going to shoot for 1,320 to 1,400 milligrams per liter. My magnesium levels were 1,440 for almost a year, and that was without any uh, additional magnesium supplementation. Typically, a high-quality synthetic sea salt is going to maintain magnesium through water changes, but once uh, magnesium starts getting above 1,440, typically around 1,500 and higher, it can become toxic to invertebrates. 
Uh, not a whole lot of study has been uh, conducted on the toxicity of magnesium, but some studies have shown that magnesium does not need to be elevated above natural seawater levels for the health of your animals. Well, guys, that's about going to wrap up this first episode of Reefing Fundamentals. In the next episode, we're going to take a look at performing our tests to determine a dosing regimen. We're also going to look at some testing tips. I'm going to show you the products that I use and how I dose my aquarium. And we're going to look at keeping a log and how important that is at determining your, your dosing regimen. Well, guys, click on the link below. Please read the article. And if you have any questions or comments, just leave them below. And looking forward to seeing you guys in the next episode of Reefing Fundamentals. Thanks for watching.